Well, it's that time. The little ones get to depart. Uh, I want to encourage you to um, share with friends and family. Next week, the Children's Sunday School class, they will have a special Christmas program for us during the morning worship. Um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. There's some fun and some prizes. The uh, theme of the morning will be Christmas memories. So they've been working hard and uh, see what's been working with them. So uh, let's be here to support mm -hmm. them next week. It's one of the best parts of the service as far as I'm concerned to see them get up. The fact that we have children uh, to get up and go and be in Sunday school. So if you're like me, I had many a part in a Christmas play or pageant. Uh, growing up in church, my, as many of you know, my grandfather was the pastor of the church where I grew up, and my grandmother, who was a reference librarian, was also in charge of the choir and did all the plays. And um, we didn't have a choice as to whether we participated. <laughs> Being her grandchildren, nobody really had a choice. And the joke was always like, no one says no to Mrs. Ford. And so that was the way it went. But. Um, great experience just to learn to be in front of people and uh, to have that those great memories so next Sunday morning that they will be a part of our worship service with their special uh, presentation it has been a week has it not mm -hmm. um, it's the second Sunday of Advent and I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that our candle this week stands for peace if ever we needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. There's an old gospel song that has those words. Uh, I was sharing uh, last week about my experiences uh, being downtown on Black Friday as part of the protests. And as the city of Chicago continues to deal with a pattern of corruption um, that's decades long in the Chicago Police Department, I have shared um, I think with some of you, I've not said it publicly, my undergraduate thesis um, dealt with the FBI consent decree on the Chicago Police Department. They had a practice of doing psychological testing on recruits in the police academy, and they basically would assign the folks who showed the least <coughs> ability to handle stress, they would assign them to high crime areas. So put the trigger happy, less psychologically stable people in the high crime uh, areas and so there has been in the early 70s a federal investigation of Chicago's police department the kinds of things that happen uh, with Laquan McDonald are not rare this is not one incident I I am saying this you may disagree but I am speaking what I believe to be true that this is a pandemic not just in Chicago but across our nation and the church must stand up the church must speak and we as citizens, whatever your political persuasion, surely you would agree that something has to be done. And then on Thursday, in the Darien, Walmart, where many of us shop, uh, we were saying before church, many of us buy the school supplies for uh, our own back to school fair. Um, an incident where someone had a gun and in an altercation injured, thankfully didn't kill another person. San Bernardino, 14 people killed, 17 people injured. In a facility that's designed to help people with disabilities. Across the country, we are in disbelief that another situation has arisen. And yesterday's New York Times had on its front page, the first time since 1920, that the New York Times had an op-ed uh, column on the front page saying, end gun violence. That there must be some way you can address this, and yet this week Congress actually failed to pass a law that would at least enact sensible gun legislation. We can quibble over the details, but I think the issue is still important. How appropriate then that the candle we light today is for peace and even more interestingly enough, that we talk about the power of blessings. In our text today, there are powerful words of blessing. First, blessing for God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, that he has looked favorably on his people. And then the blessing of a father for his son, 
whom God has revealed will have a unique role to play in the history not only of the people of Israel, but the history of the world. How wonderful for the father of little John the Baptist to speak words of life and promise about the destiny of his son. The father speaks words of blessing over a son that he never thought would come. If you remember, Elizabeth was unable to conceive. John the Baptist's conception is as miraculous, if not more so, in some ways, because Elizabeth herself was much older than Mary. A son that has a role of preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. How proud this father surely is to know that it is his son. You talk about a patriarchal society. The ancient world was nothing if not patriarchal. So the idea that you have a son blessed by God to be able as a priest to say that your son would be the one who would prepare the world for the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. Well, in our own culture, we understand the importance of blessing. We hold baby dedications. Uh, different traditions uh, sprinkle babies. We in our tradition believe in what we call believer's baptism, which means that we don't immerse or sprinkle anyone until they're of age where they can make an informed decision of faith to follow Christ. But we do believe that it's important to bring the child to God. It's important to make a statement that we will do all we can to ensure that this child has everything it needs not only for its physical well-being, but for its spiritual and psychological well-being. It's important to declare our love for our children by making a public statement that we seek God's blessing upon their lives, that we want the very best for them. And while we do this for infants, researchers tell us it's really important, no matter what age we are, that people speak words of blessing in our lives. <coughs> we know that in some parts of our city, in some parts of our metro area, in our state, and across the country, there are kids who go to school every day who maybe didn't get the most nutritious meal at home. Maybe they don't have a decent home in which to live. Maybe their only hot meals come from a school lunch program. Maybe their schools are not well resourced, but it can make a world of difference when a teacher speaks encouragement, when a teacher affirms the child's possibilities, when the teacher affirms and actually sets expectations. The idea that someone has expectations for you means that someone believes you can do it. Someone believes that you can be and do more. We understand this in our own situation. We don't always understand how much of a difference it can make to people who don't have family structures and economic situations. It's not even so much that teachers need more books in classrooms, although there are schools in Chicago where there are no books, enough books for various subjects. But people don't have jobs. People don't have decent housing. What kind of blessing can we give to a child who's going home to a desperate situation? We know that in our area, there are kids who are homeless. When we serve at PADS every year, the thing that breaks my heart is that the kids, this is their ritual. This is normal for them. They come in, they pick their cot, they put it up. Those who criticize recent generations for their approach to encouragement may have a point. We say that, oh, the millennials are spoiled because they came up in a world where all the kids get trophies and everybody's the most valuable player. I remember sending the little soccer picture for Mitchell's soccer team one summer when he was about seven or eight to my grandmother and she, it, the little frame said, most valuable player. She thought he had won the award <laughs> for being the most valuable player. And I said, Grandma, that's what the little picture frame says for all the kids. Now, mind you, in my heart, Mitchell was the most valuable <laughs> player. 
and many of his coaches tried to get him on traveling teams, but kids are not learning how to lose. They're not learning how to be resilient. They're not learning that they may not necessarily be the best at everything. And I think there is a way, as one of the foundations that we give to our children and our communities, to give them blessings. Not to give them platitudes, not to cushion them so that they don't learn from life's ups and downs, but to do what one song says, to speak life, to speak life-affirming words. Zechariah turns to the baby and says, and you, child, you are going to do something awesome. God is with you. You're going to make a difference in the world. He didn't speak something very general. He spoke something that, though seems grand, was pretty specific because Elizabeth had been told that this particular child was going to have this particular role in life. We all know how much we want to encourage any talent or gift that we see in our children or our grandchildren. There are lots of ways in which we try to do that. We attend their performances. We praise their report cards. We comfort them when they don't get the role in the play they think they should get. Now that Mitchell has grown in a way, I still enjoy going to programs and plays of other children. I'm a big fan of Sarah and Delaney Durbin. And I do that because I know how important it was because my son tells me, you would always see him come out on stage and search until he found us, and then our eyes connected. My husband and I go to piano recitals and vocal recitals of a program that one of our friends uh, runs to give kids on the south side of Chicago an opportunity to take piano lessons and voice lessons. These kids aren't ours. We don't know most of them, we just know Mike Manson and his wife, Lori, and we're there to support them and go up to the kids and tell them what a great job they've done. Blessing. The power of blessing. The power of saying that there is something within you that is special. You may not be the forerunner to the Messiah. Most of us are not. <laughs> Most of us are not gifted with extraordinary gifts of talent. But all of us are worth the blessing of God to say that God has made you and you have something important to do, something that God has given to you to do in this world. I have to think that there are kids who are in gangs, not just in Chicago, but around the country, Kids who are selling drugs because they see somebody else driving a nice car down the street and think, man, I want that. Those sneakers that the other guys have, it's cool. I want that. Do you know how much it costs to get a hair weave? <laughs> Do you know how much it costs to get braids put in your hair? I don't do these things because I can't afford these things. <laughs> I'm not going to pay over $200 to have braids put in my hair. The power of needing something that will make me feel special and accepted is worth interesting sacrifices. Do you know how much the latest sneakers cost? I'll never forget when Mitchell went from children's sizes to men's sizes. The price doubles. And everybody needs to have those sneakers. If I don't have blessing in my life, if there's no one telling me that God loves me and that there's something special in my life, I'm a little more susceptible to other external forms of affirmation. Well, when you pay attention to a child's particular interests and gifts and affirm them, then you are planting seeds not only for future success, but for their health. When you affirm even the most simple things, 
You light a candle of affirmation within a child, a person, a friend, a family member. And I'm not talking about superficial, perfunctory compliments. But even within our own church, when we affirm individual gifts to do special things. Dixie's stepping down from being a treasurer, but Dixie has always said how much she loves being a treasurer. That's kind of strange, Dixie. <laughs> that in you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Alice probably didn't want to be property manager for <laughs> But my God, we affirm that. <laughs> she has the spirit of a general contractor. <laughs> Tell Alice thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. made a difference, has made the world a brighter place to be in. There's power in affirming and giving blessing to people. Our outgoing chair, Karen, is an administrative juggernaut, I guess. <laughs> Karen's got lots of energy, great ideas. She served in this role for four years. Thank you, Karen. Our website is better, our public image and face, our literature, our materials, the structure and the way in which we handle our business. She's returning to be an elder, and we're welcoming her <coughs> to that. But we need to look around this room and see who have I not affirmed her, encouraged or appreciated. Jim Claffey. Huh. Galilee, Mac. Communion doesn't just appear. They never say anything or ask for anything. Debbie makes the bread, Nancy made it for years. Just thank you. It matters that you care enough to lay out the Lord's table for us. And if we understand how much that means to us, it means something, I think, when we tell Rick and Roll and we appreciate the music. Martha does great administrative things with our elders, our worship committee. Bill's working with the technology around our recordings of our sermons. Barb keeps that soundboard up and running. There are so many things that all of you do. Can I just say thank you? Can I tell you what a blessing each of you are? And I hope you're smiling, at least from the inside. <laughs> that each and every person who walks through this door, there is something special that God has ordained in you and through you. And if we get that for ourselves, then we are called as the Church of Jesus Christ to get that this world that looks like it's falling apart. Remember our text last week? When Jesus was talking about the falling down of Jerusalem and he said it's going to feel like all hell is broken loose. This week kind of felt like that, didn't it? There are more and more weeks like that. There are people out there that need blessing. They just need the affirmation. When you hand them a plate of food at pads or refill their drink, <coughs> A kind word, a smile, is a blessing. People in the grocery store, I was returning an item that I got at Carson Perry Scott a couple weeks ago, and it was actually <coughs> Saturday, I guess. Everybody's in the mall at Orland Square. Blah, blah, blah. I'm actually there to return something. The woman was so kind and so nice and so positive, and I said, thank you for being so pleasant in the midst of all this chaos. She says, I just don't think there's any other way to be. Being nasty is not going to help anything. And I said, amen, sister. I took her name, and I called the little line, and I said, you need to tell, her name was actually Teresa. I said, you need to applaud Teresa. Teresa was a blessing to me. And those are the words that I used. When I close my emails, I always say blessings and peace. I know a lot of my 
clergy friends will say blessing, sometimes people peace. I really mean blessings. And within my tradition, the African American church sometimes, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Everybody's talking about, oh, bless you. When you sneeze, we say bless you, bless you, bless you. These things are not lightly taken. At least not I don't take them lightly. When you say to someone, God bless you, do you realize the power in those words that you're calling down God's blessing and favor? When I say blessings and peace, I need blessings in whatever way you need them. And I need peace in whatever way you need it. The power of blessings. Blessing was thought to be so important to the ancient nation of Israel. And I'm going to close with this. That Moses told Aaron, speak these words to the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That was the benediction that my grandfather always used. And as I studied for this sermon, it hit me with great force because just last week, and I shared this, at the church that Walter and I served when we were in our early 20s, the young adult choir, or they actually wasn't young adult, but the young people's choir, high school age kids who are now in their 30s and 40s, who had a 35th anniversary reunion concert to thank the pastor who had been there when they were in high school, who is now a bishop within the denomination, one of the officiants at our wedding, and they wanted to thank the adult sponsors who had spent every Saturday from three to five with them in rehearsal. I wrote a lot of plays for those kids. We did a lot of Thanksgiving weekend retreats. We did Bible study as well as choir rehearsal. 75 not so young adults <laughs> did a concert just to say thank you for pouring into their lives. And the power of this blessing was that Bishop Jarrett, who's now retired both from that church and from being a bishop in his denomination, used to always walk the aisle at the end of the service. And the African Methodist Episcopal Church is very Anglican in its liturgy, so he was always in a robe and there were always acolytes. And the acolytes would precede him as he went down the aisle. And these words are what he said. And he not so much even the words, but the way he looked at people and would point. And he would do this. And you're going out, and then you're coming in. And you're down sitting, and then you're uprising, in your joy and your sorrow, in all that you do, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. I have the video of Bishop Jarrett walking down the aisle sharing that blessing. Do you know what I heard? Oh, oh yes. That was how it felt. The words weren't so important, but it was the love of this beloved pastor walking down the aisle and the memories that everyone had of how important it was to close that service with a good word from the Lord. The power of Bishop Jarrett giving this blessing still fell upon us. And I videotaped it because it was a momentous moment every week in service. Not just his words, but the love we knew he felt for all. So today, I'm going to end this sermon with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he lift the countenance of his peace upon you and give you peace. Share a blessing with someone this week. There is power in blessings. Amen.